today as we come to the table. I like the the clear path that he cuts. It's almost like there's all this gobbledygook in the world of religion. And the Lord came down with a laser and just cut right down the middle of it and said, we're not playing games here, Nicodemus. You're not born again. You're not getting in. What are you going to do? Wow. You see, the Lord divides everyone on two sides. There's not different religious groups. We're divided into two groups, saved, unsaved. That's God's only division in heaven, guys. He's not broken up in denominations. He's not broken up in religions. He's not broken up in opinions. He doesn't care. He died for all mankind. And he's broken us up into saved and unsaved. Sometimes it can seem as though God is mean or narrow-minded by allowing only one way to heaven through faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But that really is the only way to eternity with God. It doesn't matter how many religious acts you do. You aren't going to heaven based on your works. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. People may think there are different ways to be saved, but Pastor Mark will explain in today's message that the Bible is so clear and precise that there is only one way, no other way will work. It's written again and again, you must be born again. You need to give your life to Jesus. It's not only that simple, but it won't cost you a dime. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of John chapter 3 as he shows us why you must be born again. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to John chapter 3. Let's get into the Word. As we look today at John chapter 3 verses 1 through 16, growing up in the South, I remember two kinds of Christians. Those who were normal Christians and those who were born-again Christians. Now, some of you are going, what are you talking about? There's no such thing as any other Christian but a born-again Christian. You know that because now you know him. I know that because now I know him. But growing up in the South as an unsaved pastor's kid, until I got saved at 25, I saw two kinds of Christians in the South. The normal Christian and the born-again Christian. It wasn't until I got saved myself I realized the born-again Christians were the ones going to heaven because they had now met Christ. You see, there is no difference in Christians. The Bible teaches you're either born again or you're not going to heaven. And for me, in my mindset, if you were born again, you're one of those kind of strange, radical people who did kind of crazy things from time to time and and this kind of thing. And as long as I stayed away from them, it was no problem. I didn't have to be around them much except at Thanksgiving. And I had this wonderfully crazy family that I love more than anything now that know that knew the Lord and I didn't growing up and I used to think they were crazy but now I realize they're the ones that were right and that was my experience to the born-again Christian and yet the Lord's going to show today in this passage again there aren't as I said two different kinds there's simply a born-again believer and somebody who's not a believer and not going to heaven a lot of people today think they're going to heaven a lot of different ways But the bottom line is, unless you know Jesus and you're born for a second time, which we're going to get into in more detail, it doesn't matter how religious or how many good works you do, you are not going to heaven. It is only a spiritual experience with the Lord. And so Nicodemus now, this religious leader of the Jews, is going to come and find this out in a first-hand way. Notice there in chapter 3, verse 1, it says there was a man by the name, or rather a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, This first verse sets the stage for the scene and tells really an entire story in and of itself. This Nicodemus, first of all, Nicodemus means conqueror, which I find interesting, very appropriate to Nicodemus because we're going to see that indeed Nicodemus at some point does come to be a believer in Jesus Christ. He does conquer his battle with religion and he finally comes into a real relationship where he can go to heaven with the Lord. And so his name is very appropriate. It's fitting, Nicodemus. But also notice about Nicodemus, he was a man, it says, of the Pharisees. Now, 
there were two main religious re groups in Israel at this time what was called the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And they, they both were different groups, if you will, uh, different, different angles of belief system, but they were the religious leaders of the nation. One was the more liberal side, the Sadducees. One was the more, uh, I guess you would say, the more uh, conservative side, if you want to look at it that way, the Pharisees. They both had their problems. Uh, the, the Sadducees, they were the ones who didn't believe in the resurrection. They were the ones who were involved in church, but would say, let's not get too spiritual. Don't get weird on me, okay? Just kind of stay normal. And they didn't believe in the resurrection because of that. They had a lot of different beliefs that were incorrect based on the Word of God. And here's kind of something corny that, is, again, some of you know this, uh, and it'll, it'll help you remember it forever, and maybe you'll want to forget it and you can't. But here's why they were called the Sadducees. They didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were sad, you see. Now, that's corny. But I want you to be able to tell the difference between the two groups. That's the way you'll always remember the Sadducees. They were the group that did not believe in spiritual things. They didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. They didn't believe in resurrection. They were the religious of the group, but again, no relationship with God. Now you have the Pharisees, and among the Pharisees, they didn't really have a relationship with God either, but they were closer to the truth. They were the conservative, but they were also legalistic. They had gone too far. They had started out good in their history by trying to follow God's word and honor God. They had turned it into man-made religion and simply were following religion and man-made rules. And Jesus rebuked them as well for what they did. But neither of them were walking right with God. Neither of the religious groups of the day. And so Jesus was right in the middle of them there to correct them, if you will, for those who were correctable. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Now they were also, so they were the religious leaders of the nation, but they were also the political leaders. Now, at this time, Rome ruled the world, so they had very limited political power. Uh, Rome gave them some limited political powers. They worked within the realm of who they were and their people, but Rome limited that. But in their history, they were basically the Congress of the nation. And you could almost break them up, I guess, if you know the way they would have two houses. We have today a Senate and a Congress. Well, they had Sadducees and Pharisees, and then they had the high priest. We have a president. And again, there was no separation of church and state. The way God set it up with the nation of Israel, it was church and state. They were the religious leading body, and they were also the Congress of the nation. There was no separation, which is how God designed it and God intended it. So they set it up that way, and, and yet they veered off course. And this kind of gives you the background of who they were and why they were um, in the position they were in. And yet this gives you a very interesting insight into who this Nicodemus was. Because notice it says he was a ruler of the Jews there in, in verse 1. He was Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Later on, Jesus is also going to tell us he was the teacher of Israel, definite article in the Greek language. What does that mean? It means simply this. He wasn't just a teacher in Israel. Jesus referred to him as the teacher of Israel. No doubt he was considered the top theologian and the top teacher for all of Israel. So now you've got the top theologian, the top main guy. Again, you had the high priest. Why wouldn't he? Well, again, the high priest at this time was just a political position. He was appointed by the, Rome, by the Romans. So the top theologian and teacher would have been, it appears from what Jesus says here, Nicodemus. And most scholars believe that because of the way Jesus addressed him. And I agree with that. And so you had this top theologian, this top teacher of the nation of Israel, and you also had this top political leader for the nation of Israel. There's not really a comparison we can bring out today as far as what that would be, but just imagine at the highest echelons of American government, somebody from that place at the very peak, at the very top, at the very pinnacle comes to see Jesus and goes, what's with you? There's something about you that's different. I need to know what's going on here. And because it was uniquely combined with the politics and the religion together, it, it made for a very unique situation that Nicodemus was in. He would have been basically the top pastor and one of the pop, uh, top political leaders of the nation. And so now you see the significance here of this teacher now going to the Lord. So he goes there, notice verse 2. It says, And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now again, notice Nicodemus here comes to Jesus by night. And again, it was, it was no doubt for a number of reasons, but probably two main ones. And again, we don't know all the reasons. It doesn't tell us. But first of all, there was no doubt some fear of persecution from his colleagues. Here Nicodemus is, a top political leader, a top religious leader. They had unanimously agreed that Jesus was a rebel and was 
outside of the belief system of Israel, was a troublemaker. They had rejected him as the religious leadership already at this point. He was being shunned by them. And now Nicodemus, one of their main leaders, the main teacher of Israel, says, I'm going to go see this guy. Something about him is, is beyond the normal, and I need to find out what it is. And now he chooses to go by night, probably not wanting to be seen. So there was a, a stealth, I think, to this as far as Nicodemus was concerned. But secondly, I think Nicodemus probably being thinking, at least in a, in a worldly prudent way, was thinking, what if this guy turns out not to be someone that's important? I really shouldn't give him credibility. If I go see him and I'm the top leader of Israel and I go see this man and he's not really someone that you can put your faith in, then I've given him credibility and viability. So no doubt he was probably concerned about the image it would put across if he saw Jesus, but probably even more than that, just of the persecution he would face. And again, this would, be a not, this would not be an easy position to be in. This would be a place where, again, all of your colleagues and everyone around you, you know, again, this is, it's even worse for Nicodemus, but try to imagine it on, a, on just a lower level, your family or your friends or maybe those in the office, and every one of them think that Jesus is a fake and wrong and not any good. You're the only one that believes in him. For you to speak up, there's going to be a price to pay. And so Nicodemus knew there'd be a price to pay. So again, there's caution here on his part of this, but notice what Nicodemus does. Again, Nicodemus shows where his heart is. He shows his character and he shows that God is moving him in to believe the truth right from the onset because he approaches Jesus and says, rabbi. Now look at that word rabbi. We're going to stop there. Why? Because you were not called a rabbi in Israel unless you went to their university, their Bible college, and had been ordained by them through their university or Bible college. Otherwise, you were not considered a rabbi and or a recognized teacher of the people in a spiritual sense in Israel. Jesus had done neither. He had not been to their university or Bible college, and he had not been ordained by them, and yet the top teacher of Israel shows up and says, Rabbi. Wow. Right off the bat, we see that Nicodemus has more understanding than his colleagues he recognizes, although you've not been to our schools and you've not been ordained through us, you're of God. There's something about you that is set apart. And so he calls him rabbi. And then notice the next word he says after rabbi is we. Now this is interesting because was he saying that other leaders of the Jewish people were recognizing that, you know what? We recognize that he's somebody special, but we're not going to admit it. That's possible. He may have noticed in them the recognition of Jesus' position, some power, some authority from God, but they're not about to admit it because they think they're the authorities and they're the ones in power. And he hasn't been through their school and hasn't been ordained by them. And who does he think he is? Now, that could be part of it. But also, we find out later on, there was another secret believer in the Sanhedrin, a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. And we find out when Jesus dies, Joseph and Nicodemus are the ones that go to get the body and to bury him together. It might be that Nicodemus had run across Joseph and recognized in Joseph that he also was having some questions about the legitimacy of Jesus and saying, wait a minute, there is something about this guy. Maybe they discussed it and said, you need to go talk to him, find out what's going on. We don't know the details of this, but it wasn't just Nicodemus. He's saying, we recognize that you're a man that is sent from God. Because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So we recognize God's hand is with you. Something's going on here beyond the ordinary. And notice verse 3, Then Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now look at this. He didn't even ask how he could see the kingdom of God. I love this. Jesus knew what was in Nicodemus' heart. Nicodemus didn't say, hey, how can I see the kingdom of God? He just said, I know you're of God because nobody could do these signs. And the Lord, knowing what's in his heart, gets right to the heart of the matter. He says, Nicodemus, you can't go to heaven unless, you cannot, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He gets down to the, to the nuts and bolts of it. This is what you're seeking, Nicodemus. Why is it that I have something you don't have? Why is it that you're not in tune with the Spirit? You want to go to heaven, Nicodemus? You can't do it unless you're born again. Guys, this is one of the most powerful lines in the sand, if you will, of all history. Notice what he says. You cannot. This is a very strong statement. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. It is a line in the sand. There's no, it's, there's no ambiguity. There's no confusion. There's no lack of clarity. It is a solid, undeniable statement. You either become born again or you cannot go to heaven. End of argument. And now you're going to see in just a moment how shocked Nicodemus is by this. The Lord sees it because he, he, he says, hey, why are you marveling? I marveled when I came across this. Growing up as to what I thought was a Christian in name in the South, 
being a pastor's kid, being unsaved and not knowing I was unsaved. When I began to see in God's word and people started showing me what Jesus said, these were radical things to me. Nobody ever told me that it was that narrow. I'd never heard that, you know, you, you, if, you, if you're not born again, you can't go to heaven. I thought that was just some group of people that were a little bit too enthusiastic about Jesus. And now all of a sudden I read this and I was shocked. I was like, why didn't anyone show this to me? Now, probably someone did and my eyes were closed and I couldn't see it. I don't know. But guys, this is the first time Nicodemus' eyes are open. This is radical to him. What do you mean born again? I mean, this, this statement here excludes every other religion or heavenly track that anyone tries to take to get to heaven and just says they are wrong. This is what I love about Jesus. Don't get me wrong. I don't get excited that lots of people are, are deceived, but I get excited that I know exactly what is required to go to heaven. I don't like ambiguity. What if there were all these different options? What if you could get there by all religions? What if you could get there by all belief systems? What if everyone just really went to heaven? Well, how do we know? How can we be sure? i like someone with authority to come along and say, everyone can't go to heaven, or everyone rather won't go to heaven. Everyone can go to heaven, but not everyone will, but only those who go through this particular door. Jesus said, I am the door. He said, narrow is the gate. He said, but broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in there by. Most people are unsaved, he's saying. Most people are in this broad gate that are not getting into heaven. So I don't rejoice about that. I, I grieve over that. And that's why I do what I do, called in the ministry, so that those that aren't in can get in. But I rejoice over the fact that I know how to get in myself. And you know how to get in. And if you didn't know, now you do know. You can't get in unless you're born again. There's no other option. You have to be born once and you have to be born a second time. We'll get to that in just a moment. But what this means is, and this is what I love about Jesus in his radical statements, because again, there's no ambiguity. You don't have to guess whether or not. Jesus is saying this, Hinduism, you'll not go to heaven. Krishna, you'll not go to heaven. Buddhism, you will not go to heaven. Islam, you will not go to heaven. It is only through Jesus Christ and being born again through his sacrifice on the cross. I like the clarity. I like the, the clear path that he cuts. It's almost like there's all this gobbledygook in the world of religion. And the Lord came down with a laser and just cut right down the middle of it and said, we're not playing games here, Nicodemus. You're not born again. You're not getting in. What are you going to do? Wow. You see, the Lord divides everyone on two sides. There's not different religious groups. We're divided into two groups, saved, unsaved. That's God's only division in heaven, guys. He's not broken up in denominations. He's not broken up in religions. He's not broken up in opinions. He doesn't care. He died for all mankind. And he's broken us up into saved and unsaved. And we have a choice to make if we're going to be in the kingdom of God. And while I said, as, you know, this bothers some, I know that it does. I like it because it gives me a solid path to follow and gives me clarity. Well, now Nicodemus sees this and he's challenged. Look at this, verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, again, I don't think Nicodemus believed he could, that he could enter into his mother's womb and be born a second time. And I don't think that he was being sarcastic. I think he's in shock. What are you talking about? I, I'm one of the religious, religious leaders of the nation. I've never heard this in my life. It's because you're walking in darkness, Nicodemus. You're a blind leader of the blind. And we've got a lot of them today, by the way. But now he's opening Nicodemus' eyes. He's speaking the truth to him. And, and again, I think he's simply demonstrating his shock and lack of understanding in a very dramatic way. Notice Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now notice Jesus says we have to be born two different times in order to go to heaven. We have to be born one time in the flesh, and we have to be born one time in the spirit. Now, we know the spirit, that's pretty easy. You have to be born, he said, again, in the spirit. We know that has to happen. But he says also you have to be born in the flesh. You have to be born of water, which he describes what that means. Now, a lot of people try to say born of water, that means you have to be baptized. That doesn't mean that at all. Because, again, what about the man on the cross? Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He was never baptized. 
What about all the people without history who were converted in their deathbed and they died before they could be baptized? No, this is not talking about baptism as a requirement for salvation. This is simply talking about being born once in the flesh and then being born once in the spirit. When we are born in our flesh, we're born of water. You're inside your mother's womb. You're surrounded by water. You're in water. And then you're born of water. And Jesus describes it. You know, Scripture is the best interpreter of Scripture. And in verse 6, he tells us what he's talking about. Flesh is flesh. Spirit is spirit. All of us have been born once in the flesh, but now we have to be born again in the spirit. Guys, if you're only born once, you'll die twice. But if you are born twice, you'll only die once. Mark, what do you mean? If you're only born once in the flesh, you will die in the flesh and you'll die eternally in the spirit. But if you're born again in the spirit, you leave this body. I won't even say die once because you don't die, you move but you leave this body and then you enter into the kingdom of God and, and, and again, you die one time, so to speak, and you live forever. This is what God was telling Nicodemus and this is what he was trying to get, trying to get across to Nicodemus. And so he says, you have to be born a couple of times. I know I've shared this with you guys before and I see these bumper stickers. I, it just seems appropriate to bring it up again. Maybe you've seen them and, I, and my heart always grieves when I see them. I don't get angry, I get sad for them. But these bumper stickers that say, born okay the first time. They're deceived. The Bible says every single person that's ever been born was born a guilty sinner. Now, but I hadn't sinned yet as a baby. Your blood was already tainted with the guilt of sin. The Bible says that as we got our bloodline passed down from Adam and all generations after that and carried on through Noah after the flood, every generation carries in our veins at our very birth the guilt of sin. We are guilty. It's in our blood. We inherited that blood from someone else. We didn't start with our own blood. That blood was given to us through the conception of the relationship of our parents. It was created through that union, and we inherit that blood. And so we already have a tainted blood system, so to speak, which means the only way we can get around that tainted blood and be forgiven is to get new blood to wash it clean, the blood of Jesus. And so the Lord does that. He cleanses us, and he makes us new. And he says, you have to be born both ways, Nicodemus. It's not enough to be born one time. You've got to be born a second time because you're born guilty. You're already born a sinner. And look what he says in verse 7. Again, now Nicodemus, just like I was, was shocked by this. I don't know if it was showing on Nicodemus' face, which it probably was. It might have just been the fact that the Lord knew what was going on in his heart. But he was marveling. How, what's, what are you talking about? Look at verse 7. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Look at this line in the sand drawn again. You cannot go to heaven unless you're born again. You must be born again or you can't go to heaven. Again, I love the definitiveness, the, the straight line that the Lord draws. No ambiguity here. And, and again, very obviously Nicodemus was shocked or the Lord wouldn't have said this. He said, you're in the dark and yet you're a spiritual leader. You must be born again or else you can't enter. There's no other option. Notice he now describes it. He says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Interesting thing about wind. If I was to ask you, hey, can you see the wind? You probably would say, yeah, yeah, I see it. I see the trees blowing. But you really don't see the wind at all, do you? Nobody can see the wind. What you're seeing is the result of the wind blowing in the trees. What you're hearing is the sound of the wind blowing uh, you know, through the window or whatever the case might be, which makes this very interesting because probably as the Lord is giving this illustration, they're probably seeing and hearing the wind blow. Why do I say that? Well, Jesus was staying at someone's house as a guest for the Passover. And the guest houses in that day were up on the roof. And the way they would build it is you would have your main family home in here and you would build a guest home up on the roof so the guests didn't have to come through the family, you know, to go and get to their room. They would literally have their own staircase on the outside of the house. They would go up their staircase up to the roof and they had these flat roofs where they would eat dinner and they would sit out there and talk and it was like a, a deck or a porch. And then they would go into their room, which was up there on the upper part. No doubt that's where Jesus was. He would have been a guest. That ends our time at the table of God's Word for today. Pastor Mark is taking us through the book of John, the last of the four Gospels in the New Testament. 
This book follows Jesus through his ministry while he was here on earth, but gives you a unique perspective from one of Jesus' apostles. John paints a picture for you of the Son of God, a Savior who has all the authority and power of heaven. And we're so glad you tuned in to discover this testimony of our Lord, and we hope you'll continue to join us. Do you have a question about what you heard today? We're here to answer them. You can call 865-609-1385 or visit the Pastor Mark Kirk page on Facebook or visit the contact page on PastorMarkKirk.com. And if you're in the Knoxville area, we'd love to meet you. Here's Pastor Mark to tell you more. If you don't have a home church, I'd love for you to come and join us this Sunday morning at either our 930 or 1115 services. We also have a Bible study on Sunday evenings at 6, a 7 p.m. service on Wednesday, as well as activities for kids, youth, and college throughout the week. No matter what time you can come, each time we get together is a sweet time of community and learning about God. If you'd like more info about who we are and what we do, just go to PastorMarkKirk.com and click on Our Church in the menu. Thanks, Pastor Mark, and we hope you can join us next time as we continue our verse-by-verse study of John the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary, Knoxville.